Uh, so good evening, everyone. Hope you are doing well. Uh, in today's session, which is my lecture number ninety-five of my lecture series, we are going to talk about the latest guidelines uh, from the Endocrine Society, which were just published in July twenty twenty-five uh, around uh, primary aldosteronism. This is a further update to the twenty sixteen guidelines, which were last published for the same condition. Again, this is a very important set of uh, guidelines for the upcoming exams, for specialty exams, European Board exam. As well as the endocrinology board exams across the world, so let's start right away. Now, as I had mentioned, that this is an update to the twenty sixteen guidelines. So, all those who are my paid subscribers, of course, must have uh, listened to my initial lecture on hyperaldosteronism and Crohn syndrome. Again, this is a very important session based on twenty sixteen guidelines, and here I had also discussed several case scenarios. For adrenal vein sampling, which is very important for exams as well as for clinical practice, so do listen to this lecture as well. Plus, this latest lecture on the uh, same condition with the latest update. So, as and when the guidelines come up, I will be recording new lectures uh, when there is a change or update in the guidelines, and I will be definitely telling you all uh, towards the end of this lecture as well the difference. Or the updates between 2016 and 2025 guidelines for Crohn syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism. So let's start uh, this session by different case-based scenarios. In this particular session, which is my lecture number 95, I'm going to take you all through six questions or six case-based scenarios, which will help us cover this particular guidelines in detail. And as I mentioned towards the end, I'm going to put up a chart whereby I'll explain the differences between the 2016 and 2025 guidelines. So let's start right away. We have a 37-year-old man with a high BMI of 33.4 kg per meter square. He does have well-controlled hypertension, has borderline hypokalemia, is uh, diagnosed uh, with. Uh, Primary aldosteronism. Uh, in a shared decision making with his physician, he decides against doing any adrenal vein sampling or surgery, and is counselled about the potential advantages of a switch to a primary aldosteronism specific therapy. The patient is well insured, and uh, several specific drug options are available in his country. After discussion of these options, he asks for the advice from the physician about which to choose. So, which of the following drugs should be considered the first line in most male patients with primary aldosteronism? Should we use epirenone? Should we use spironolactone? Should we use finrenone? Should we use amiloride or should we use isazerinone? So, the correct answer here is definitely spironolactone. So, this particular. Uh, uh things uh, are what we look at of course in terms of the blood pressure control both are equally potent spironolactone as well as a epirenone in terms of the dosing it's once a day dosing for spironolactone uh epirenone is short acting and needs twice daily dosing in terms of the side effects we do look into spironolactone uh for the side effects which it can cause breast enlargement or tenderness it can cause low libido these are both the side effects in males. Electrolyte changes can happen in both uh, males and females. And in females, it can uh, cause spotting in between the menses. Whereas for epilinone, it's mostly to do with the electrolyte changes. In terms of the monitoring frequency, that's pretty much the same for both the medications. Uh, contraindicated definitely in pregnancy. In terms of the cost, spironolactone is much, much, much cheaper. And hence, it is one of the frontline agents, or we can say the first line therapy for cases of primary aldosteronism as per the endocrine society guidelines as well. Let's move on to our question scenario two. For which of the following patients should the healthcare provider order a test to detect a possible diagnosis of primary aldosteronism? Now, this is a very important question because this is one of the important updates in this 2025 endocrine society guidelines. So, option A, a 25-year-old woman with BMI of 19 and a confirmed systolic and diastolic hypertension on 24-hour ABPM 
should this patient be screened to detect PA or option B, a 45-year-old man with BMI uh, in the overweight range, hypertension controlled on combined long-acting nifedipine and an ACE inhibitor and has recurrent unprovoked hypokalemia. Option C, a 65-year-old man with 3-drug hypertension has normal serum potassium and a 1.7 centimeters left adrenal mass noted on a recent CT scan taken for suspected nephrolithiasis. Or option D, a 52-year-old woman with BMI of 34, family history of hypertension and home blood pressure readings in the range of 148 for 94, which is definitely elevated, in the absence of any pharmacotherapy. Or the option E, which is all of the above. Or option F, like only cases A, C and D. So which of this is the right answer? The correct answer here is all of the above. So this is a very important uh, update, as I mentioned in this guidelines, which is different from the previous guidelines. So this is also a, a recommended update in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, as well as the European Society of Hypertension guidelines, which were published in 2024. So all three societies, like the Endocrine Society, the ESH and the ESC, have uh, combined made this recommendation now. And this is totally different from the uh, previous guidelines in 2016. So basically, they indicate that we should target case finding in all the cases of hypertension, all the cases, not only limited to unprovoked hypokalemia or not only limited to resistant hypertension or not only to limited to patients who have uh, adrenal mass or not only limited to patients who have sleep apnea with hypertension. So the 2025 guidelines retain all of this and expand screening indication to all patients with confirmed chronic hypertension. Hence, option E, which is all of the above, is the right answer. So this is very, very important. The rationale for expanding the screening derives from several considerations. One is that primary aldosteronism has specific and highly effective therapy like spironolactone that can decrease cardiorenal injury, yet it remains woefully underdiagnosed and therefore undertreated across the world. And hence, this uh, indication has been expanded to consider screening in all patients with hypertension. Many patients with primary uh, aldosteronism remain undiagnosed until presenting with late and or severe disease and years of prior ineffective treatments and already have developed target organ injury. Thirdly, when primary aldosterone screening is performed by measuring the aldosterone renin ratio, preparing for and interpreting the result is often more difficult when it has been delayed to the point when multiple antihypertensives are already started for the patient. Uh, and by that time, already complications like chronic kidney disease has developed. So undertaking biochemical screening before initiating potentially confounding medication should facilitate optimal test interpretation for current or future use in the uh, patient management. The Clinical Practice Guidelines Committee recognizes the successful implementation of this recommendation as per the local testing resources. And that's why it's very, very important that also primary aldosteronism screening should be taken in existing patients with hypertension uh, if it was not done previously. So these are some important updates from the 2025 guidelines. Let's move on to question scenario three. Here we have a 56-year-old woman presenting for hypertension management. Her blood pressure is 142 by 92 millimeter mercury while on treatment with lisinopril uh, 40 mg daily. Testing for, again, primary aldosteronism is conducted while she remains on lisinopril therapy, which is ACE inhibitor. Her lab results reveal potassium of 3.5, which is at the lower end, plasma aldosterone, of 8.8 .8 nanogram per deciliter or 244 picomole per liter. And this is done by the uh, liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, as is the recommendation. Plasma renin activity, again done by the same assay, is pretty low at 0.3 and aldosterone renin ratio is definitely elevated. Anything more than 20 is very, very high. It's around uh, 29 nanogram per DL. Uh, per nanogram per ml per hour. So definitely aldosterone renin act ratio is elevated. Which of the following represents the next best step to confirm or exclude a diagnosis of 
primary aldosteronism in this patient should we conduct now a suppression test like confirmatory test like an oral sodium suppression test or should we do an iv saline suppression test or should we initiate mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist therapy and no further testing is needed should we uh, give the patient potassium to let it become four and then retest or should we stop his ace inhibitor for four weeks and retest so what are the recommendations based on the latest guidelines so the correct answer here is initiate mineralocorticoid therapy mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist therapy and no further testing is needed why patient has hypertension, borderline hypokalemia, suppressed renin, and an inappropriate aldosterone production as evidenced by the, uh, of course, the uh, baseline aldosterone levels, as well as a very much elevated ARR. So these biochemical abnormalities, despite current concurrent use of an ACE inhibitor, which is basically a medicine which is designed to raise renin and potassium and should suppress aldosterone. So if the patient is already on an ACE inhibitor, and despite that, he has a suppressed renin and a higher aldosterone and a very high aldosterone renin ratio. Definitely, the patient has got primary aldosterone. So, so this is sufficient enough to diagnose PA. Now, the uh, as far as the medications are concerned, in terms of the medications, so basically, as per the 2025 guidelines, uh, as the observation of renin-independent aldosterone production, despite the use of medications that are known to cause increased renin, like for example, this patient was on uh, yeah, like ACE inhibitors, which is a renin-angiotensin system inhibitors, or even if the patient was on a diuretic, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, or an epithelial sodium a channel inhibitor, uh, this actually should go on to suppress aldosterone. And in this case scenario, despite the patient is being on an ACE inhibitor, his aldosterone is elevated. And definitely, we don't need to do any further testing. Now, confirmatory testing was formally recommended as an obligatory step in uh, primary aldosteronism. Okay, this was as per the 2016 guidelines. So, uh, they had recommended uh, that we need to do further uh, confirmatory test once we get a high ARR. However, this is no longer recommended as per the latest guidelines. Okay. Secondly, very important thing is that uh, such a patient, in such a patient, replenishing potassium or withdrawing lisinopril and repeating testing is absolutely not necessary as per the latest guidelines. Then, Further, as we go down, for these patients, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist therapy may be the most appropriate and, and peric choice to go forward to treat the patient's primary aldosteronism. Okay, so this is very, very important um, uh, as per the latest guidelines. And clearly, there is no need to wait and replenish for the serum potassium and definitely not any need to withdraw lisinopril in this case scenario. So moving forward to the case scenario four, but that's also the end of my preview for this session. Uh, I have uh, done another three questions or case scenarios to cover the 2025 guidelines in detail. So total of six case scenarios in this particular lecture. If you like to listen to my full session, please subscribe to my lecture series, which has so far 95 lectures with a one-time subscription fees. You can have access to all the existing 95 lectures, plus all my lectures, which will be coming in the coming weeks and months and years. So just simply send me an email to mazirules at gmail.com or you can WhatsApp me on 0097155743 all the best for the upcoming exams. Uh, as you all know that uh, there are two exams coming up this year. One is the specialty certificate exam, which is will be held in November 2025. And then again in December 2025, we'll have the European board exam. Uh, as I mentioned, my mastering endocrine uh, and diabetes lecture series so far comprises of 95 lectures, which is covering the entire spectrum for uh, the endocrinology and diabetes. And uh, as and when the new guidelines come up, I am updating and uh, recording new lectures 
and uh, trying the best to provide a resource which will be helpful to you to pass these exams as well as uh, in clinical practice. So thank you so much and uh, uh, wish you all the best.